It's my pleasure to ask Joseph Jobin of Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta. Joseph is a member of the Sucker Creek First Nation. He began working for the Treaty 8 First Nations Office of Alberta as the Environment Manager and Land Acting Land Management and Resource Development Manager. He has served as the Livelihood Director and is currently Chief Operating Officer. Um, so thank you very much. Joseph, we look forward to to hearing your, your words. Thank you. Following um, Joseph is Clayton. Uh, can I just check that Clayton is here? Thank you very much. Kia ora, Clayton. Um, let me just briefly um, tell you about Clayton if you haven't read his bio. Clayton Leonard is an alumni of the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. Um, his practice focuses on consultation issues between First Nations, the resource sector and governments. And a significant amount of Clayton's work is, uh, relates to water management and allocation, treaty water rights and other water issues facing First Nations. My name, as she said, was Joseph Job, and I'm from the Sucker Creek First Nation. It's on the western shore of the Lesser Slave Lake. Um, what we do is I work for the Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta. We are an administrative organization that advocates, facilitates, and coordinates on behalf of the 24 First Nations, the First Nation governments in northern Alberta. Treaty 8 extends up into uh, BC, northeast northeast northeastern BC, northwestern Saskatchewan, and parts of the Northwest Territory, basically up to the Great Slave Lake. What we do for the Treaty 8 on water and lands issues, we have what we call a Chief's Livelihood Committee, and we have representatives from each of the tribal councils, the five tribal councils in Treaty 8, and the two independent First Nations, Big Stone and Smith's Landing. Each of these tribal councils send a representative and um, the Chief's Livelihood Committee and the consultation technical team are basically our Board of Governors for the livelihood and lands issues. What they do is they direct our livelihood department. They formulate and uh, uh, advise our office on what Treaty 8 and you know what should we should be doing about lands and water issues. What we've talked about, some of the projects that we've had to uh, deal with and uh, we worked with our partners on is um, the upstream, the dam projects. Um, Treaty 8 territory, especially in Alberta, we have uh, the Peace River and the Athabasca are the two main rivers that uh, we deal with in the, land, the water issues. So anything that happens with uh, the Peace River and uh, what BC does with their dams, we look to partner with um, our Treaty 8 organization from BC. We uh, support them. Treaty 8 uh, chiefs from Alberta have made it to um, meetings in BC, Fort St. John. They've lent their support. We've invited them back and forth for Treaty 8 BC. Um, basically what happens, and I think what a lot of people forget, especially in BC, is what they do there does affect us downstream. And uh, a lot of our First Nations are on that Peace River and they are affected by what happens with the dams. We also take a look at what we do for downstream communities in Fort McMurray, Fort Chippewan, and Smith's Landing. But we also take a look at what happens with um, First Nations along the Mackenzie River in Northwest Territories. Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta have signed a, a memorandum of understanding with the, the Dene in Northwest Territories. And that's basically based on the fact that, you know, we're also part of, they're part of Treaty 8 as well. Our, so, we try to keep that look at you know, what happens, what's happening downstream, what's happening upstream. So we're working with our partners across the First Nations. Um, in Alberta, what we take a look a lot of, spend a lot of time on is groundwater. Um, how do we take a look? What's going to be happening with government of Alberta in their uh, uh, hydrological fracturing, uh, the fracking, the fish contamination in Athabasca River and the lakes? We take a look um, at the oil spills. Is something that's been uh, our livelihood department has started to look at now a lot more closely, uh, not just the ones Rainbow Lake, Lubicon Lake, you know, there's other small ones, one that just happened a couple weeks ago up in uh, Chinchaga, and uh, Duncan's First Nation is uh, working on that one. And so what we do with those ones, those First Nations, they are the experts in their traditional territories. They're the ones who uh, know how it's, you know, those ones who are affected. 
So treaty aid organization, what we do is we support them, and our role is the support the support role. But we also what we try to do is get that message out to we're we're, we're based in Edmonton. So we try to get the message out to our partners who live in the urban settings, uh, some of the other treaty areas. What um, Duncan's is looking at right now when they're dealing with it, they're on the ground, they're dealing with the pipeline companies, they're dealing with the people who are affected, the hunters, the trappers, the harvesters in that area who may be affected by the spills. What Kevin and our team does is we're trying to get that message out to the wider public. Um, you know, they don't have time to do that. They're dealing with the issue at hand. Uh, we also work with uh, energy and SRD ministries, uh, environment, trying to get them to work with our First Nations a little bit more than what they do. We've had uh, consultation. Uh, our office doesn't do consultations because consultation is something that is done by the First Nations at their level. But what we try to do is encourage some of the staff and the workers in the Government of Alberta Ministries to work better with the First Nations. Um, what we find sometimes is there's a lot of um, um, skimming. It's, it's very light discussions. They don't want to get into the issues. They don't want to talk with First Nations about how it's really affecting them. So what we try to do is encourage the staff. They're, you know, some of them, some of the bureaucrats, they're, they're well-intentioned. They want to look after the water. They're just not. I don't think they exactly know how to work with First Nations. We try to assist them with that. What we try to do also in Treaty 8 is um, <clears throat> what we've been trying to do in the last little while is formulate a, uh, a Treaty 8 um, position on water. We've done uh, different ideas. Um, individual First Nations have put forth some ideas, but the territory is so vast. Uh, the concerns that in northeastern Alberta um, are a little bit different from what's happening in northwestern Alberta. Uh, all these things, uh, trying to bring that coordinated, uh, unified voice is part of what Kevin and uh, Free to Do out of our Treaty 8 Livelihood Office. We work with uh, the WPACs, uh, initiator groups, trying to help get a better voice for First Nations. Um, different advocacy groups here in the city. We're trying to work with um, subtables, trying to formulate Alberta government to start working with uh, subtables, set up uh, water subtables so they can talk with the individual tribal councils and uh, actually start getting our voices heard. We partnership with the Keepers of the Athabasca, it's a long standing resolution. The uh, Treaty 8 chiefs have made a resolution that they support the ideals and the and the passions for that, and so that has continued. Uh, Northwest, T B Northwest Territories, I guess, talked about the MOU and the BC Tribal Group Associations, and we look for allies. That's part of what we're doing in the Treaty 8 office. Um, our website is here in Edmonton. Well, the website's on the internet, but our office is here in Edmonton, and I encourage anybody who wants to, you know, we are, we could be a first contact for any ally groups. Um, Kevin and Frida out of our office would be happy to pass the message on, uh, introduce you to some of the people that need to be uh, spoken to in the First Nations, bring you, into the, bring you to the right people, bring your message across. What Treaty 8 is looking, like I said, is we're advocates, we facilitate and we're helping to coordinate the message. Thank you. My presentation is a little, little more formal than, than Joe's. I'm not sure uh, entirely who the audience uh, is here today. So with that in mind, uh, what I'm going to do is um, give you a quick sense of uh, what the, the legal basis for First Nation water rights uh, in Canada might be, and then move past that into a discussion of uh, what, what are the economic implications of uh, whether or not First Nations have these rights. Um, so I'll just uh, get right into that. Hopefully I don't bore all of you to death. There's lots of coffee in the back of the room, so grab a cup if you need to. Um, so just to begin with some clarity, I, I've heard a lot of misstatements from Government of Alberta officials, uh, um, uh, people on uh, the federal side of the table that First Nations are claiming all the water in Alberta or, or compensation for uh, you know, non-native use throughout uh, Canada. That's just 
not the case, uh, it, it, to my knowledge. Um, the First Nations that our firm work, works with uh, have made the following claims. The, the right to use uh, the water resources on their reserve lands to meet the needs of their community institutions, uh, housing for housing, fisheries, water management, agriculture, and commercial development. There's an internal limitation to this water right. It's limited by the amount of reserve land and the population of the communities. So there is no, there has been no um, uh, claim made to uh, an unlimited or unfettered right to use water. Uh, they've also claimed a right to use, uh, to safe water supplies, to have uh, local uh, government uh, govern water resources, a right to quantity and quality uh, off reserve, both in terms of water and related aquatic and riparian habitat to support treaty hunting, fishing, and trapping rights, and a right to be meaningfully consulted about key water management decisions that might affect these rights or their other interests. A couple of years ago, uh, as a part of a response to the, uh, uh, the dreadful state of uh, drinking water supplies in, in um, First Nations across the country, the federal government struck up the National Engineering Assessment. It is a lower grade engineering assessment of First Nation drinking water systems across the country, but nonetheless it's the most thorough look so far. It concluded uh, independently that $4.7 billion in funding is required over the next 10 years to ensure that First Nations enjoy the same uh, safe drinking water supplies that other Canadians enjoy. Uh, Alberta, uh, despite our wealth here in this province, is no exception. Um, in this province, the assessment identified a need for $162 million in funding to uh, bring First Nation drinking water systems up to standards considered safe by the federal government itself. 64% of First Nation systems in the province um, don't have certified operators. 82, percent, uh, 82 of the systems uh, inspected in Alberta, uh, of, of those systems, 26% or 21 are high risk. That, that means they pose a, a real and immediate threat to human health. You can get sick from drinking the water in those communities. Um, 48 were considered medium risk, which means that over the long, uh, the short term, um, if parts aren't replaced and upgrades done and training for staff put in place, they will pose a high risk to the community. 13 were low risk, but that sounds better than it is. 11 of those 13 systems are actually run by adjacent municipalities. So at the end of the day, there's three out of 82 systems in Alberta that are considered safe. Um, there's Unfortunately, since the National Engineering Assessment, which is now a couple of years old, no binding commitment from the federal government to um, cover this funding deficit. Um, and nor is there any plan to come up with money in the course of implementing Bill S-8, which is the new Safe Drinking Water for First Nations Act, which is one of the reasons why the Chief's Assembly recently withdrew their support for Bill S-8. This is a map from the National Engineering Assessment of the high, medium, and low risk systems, First Nation systems in Alberta. I think an interesting thing about the map is in the media tends to portray First Nation drinking water safety issues as a northern issue. That's clearly not the case. If you look at this map, the red dots, some of them are adjacent to major municipalities in Alberta. So First Nations, um, next to folks in this city. Uh, you can turn on the tap and be assured you're not gonna get sick here in Edmonton, but your First Nation neighbors don't, don't enjoy the same uh, uh, standard of water services. The other uh, side of, of the economics or economic challenges of, uh, for First Nations is the um, the new water market systems being introduced by the government of Alberta. Uh, the first one was done in 2006, and it covers the region from 
uh, around the Bow River Basin all the way to the American border. Uh, roughly corresponds to the boundaries of Treaty uh, 7. Um, and this is the way these markets work. Uh, there's you, no new licenses from the Crown will be issued. So the basin is, uh, the term they use is closed. Um, free licenses from the Crown have been issued since 1895. There's 22,000 licenses that have been given away in southern Alberta. So the market then, uh, the, uh, the changes then authorize the sale and purchase of existing licenses. So all those 22,000 license holders who paid nothing uh, for, for their rights to use water now are sitting on a gold mine. They're, the whole system is governed by the first in time, first in right system, which despite its, uh, its name does not recognize any prior presence of First Nations or, or build that into, uh, into the system. It, it works quite simply. A senior license has complete priority over a license that's more junior. So if I have a 1935 license and you have a 1992 license and we have a drought, I get every drop of the water I'm entitled to before you get any. So the more senior a license is in the water market, uh, the more its uh, economic value. Now, to cover its behind, Alberta has decided that they have to at least create the appearance of having done something for First Nations. So they create what's called a Crown Reservation under the Water Act. Uh, and I'll get into uh, uh, some of the details of this, but um, essentially it, it enables Alberta to say that licenses are still available for nothing from the Crown for First Nations which there's a great deal of dispute whether they can even impose the Water Act system on First Nation lands. Alberta's position, uh, backstopping all of uh, the development of the water markets and their discussions with First Nations has been that First Nations never had any water rights. And if they did, um, they're gone. And they're unwilling to discuss any rights or jurisdictional issues although these, by any honest assessment, are unresolved issues in, in uh, Canada's legal system. Um, so it's very difficult for First Nations to participate in watershed groups and those kinds of things if you can't bring the very issues that matter to you to those tables. The uh, Minister's Advisory Group, or MAG, uh, is the first thorough academic look at Alberta's water allocation system. It was led by uh, David Percy from the Faculty of Law here at uh, the University of Alberta. It was quite a closed door affair though. There was no public input, no First Nation input, no First Nation representation. And uh, the terms of reference were narrow enough to really tie the minister's advisory group's hands from looking at any unresolved First Nation issues. Um, but nonetheless, that hasn't stopped them from recommending that eventually water markets should cover the entirety of the province of Alberta. And steps are, are being taken in that direction. So what's a Crown Reservation? It's a regulation under the Water Act that purports to set aside all the unallocated water in a basin. Um, the difficulty with this is when you introduce a Crown Reservation as part of a water market, the thing that made the water market necessary is that the basin's over allocated. So it doesn't take a hydrologist, a lawyer, an academic. Uh, you know, I, I could have a discussion with my uh, daughter who's in grade one that I'm gonna give her uh, all the water left in this empty glass and she would get quite quickly that she's not getting much of anything, so. Um, The other trouble with the Crown Reservations is that they're uh, linked quite often, um, without exception actually, with, by Alberta to uh, what the province calls water supply agreements that come with extremely onerous terms. So if a First Nation actually wants a license from the Crown Reservation that covers off its needs for the long term, there's uh, effectively a, a requirement in the agreement that the First Nation um, surrender or release any, any and all of its claims to uh, water rights 
including jurisdiction over water on reserve in exchange for a water license. So this is, these are slides taken directly from a recent PowerPoint presentation given by Government of Alberta officials at a public meeting uh, um, for a group of First Nations. Um, this slide describes the Crown Reservation and it basically explains what I've already explained to you except uh, note on the bottom uh, that it states that the Crown Reservation or licenses from it would have junior standing with a priority date being the date that the Crown Reservation is established which is the date always is the after the last license ever granted in the basin. So this, this slide confirms that First Nations are gonna get the most junior licenses from the basin. Well, is that an issue if you're still gonna get your water? Not a, maybe not on a practical level. But let's take a look at the subsequent slide. This is, this is uh, Alberta's honest assessment based on its water modeling studies uh, in a Treaty 6 water basin. And you take a look at the highlighted part. Water security for junior licenses is not strong. That's an interesting understa understatement. We estimate that a new junior license would receive their water one out of every three years, depending on the flow of the river. So you give up your treaty water rights in an agreement in exchange for the last water license ever granted in the basin. And then you do community planning, economic development, and meet the needs of your people on the basis of a license that's only going to secure water supply one out of every three years. It's an inconscionable uh, bargain. 